This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Venezuela's opposition is calling on the United States and allied nations to consider using military force to topple the government of Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro. This comes as U.S. Vice President Mike Pence heads to Bogotá, Colombia, today to meet with regional leaders and Venezuela's self-proclaimed president, opposition leader Juan Guaidó. A top Venezuelan opposition leader named Julio Borges told The Wall Street Journal, quote, we will present firm positions which are an escalation of diplomatic measures and political measures, including the use of force for blocking the humanitarian aid and generating an unprecedented violence. The meeting comes after a dramatic weekend which saw the Venezuelan military block the delivery of so-called humanitarian aid from entering the country at the Colombia and Brazilian borders. At least four people died and hundreds were injured after clashes broke out between forces loyal to Maduro and the supporters of the opposition. According to some reports, supporters of the opposition threw rocks and Molotov cocktails. The Venezuelan security forces and civilian groups known as colectivos responded with force, including tear gas and rubber bullets. Two trucks carrying aid were set on fire on the Colombian side of the border. The United Nations, the Red Cross and other relief organizations have refused to work with the U.S. on delivering aid to Venezuela, which they say is politically motivated. Venezuela has allowed aid to be flown in from Russia and from some international organizations, but it's refused to allow in the aid from the United States, describing it as a Trojan horse for an eventual U.S. invasion. Over the weekend, U.S. officials ramped up pressure on the Maduro government. On Sunday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Maduro's days in office are numbered. He also threatened more sanctions are coming. Republican Senator Marco Rubio of Florida tweeted the violence on the border, quote, opened the door to various potential multilateral actions not on the table just 24 hours ago, unquote. In what many saw as a cryptic threat to Maduro, Rubio tweeted an image of a bloodied Muammar Gaddafi as he was being killed following the U.S. bombing campaign of Libya. Rubio also tweeted photos of former Panamanian leader Manuel Noriega, who was removed from power during the U.S. invasion in 1989, remained in a U.S. jail for years. We're joined right now by the Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Ariaza. Welcome back to Democracy Now. Really? It's good Fantastic. to have you with us. Thank you very much. Um, can you start off by talking about what happened on the borders? Why did at least four people die? Yes, thank you very much, Amy, Juan. It's a pleasure and my honor to be here once again. And it's important for the American people to listen to us as well, because we have what we believe is our truth, or in any case, it's the other version that you will not hear in the traditional mainstream media. So I, I must say that what we saw last uh, Saturday in, uh, in the border, in both borders, with Colombia and Brazil, this was a spectacle. It was a show. You know? There were hundreds of journalists of, of, of TV stations um, broadcasting live. And uh, the intention was, as you said, we believe it's a Trojan horse. It was to break our sovereignty with a so-called humanitarian aid, which is not. And uh, it reminds us of, for example, Dominican Republic, 1965, where behind the, after the so-called humanitarian aid, 8,000 Marines came in, overthrew the government of Juan Bosch, and they took power and installed a dictatorship for decades. So what we, what we saw is, um, Juan said that the colectivos had answered with rubber bullets. No, it was the National Guard and the police. The front line was the police, the, the Policia Nacional Bolivariana. The second line, the National Guard. And then, of course, there were people that were wanted to defend our sovereignty and that were there also. No one was killed in Táchira in or in, in the Colombian side, which was the real the real problem. The events happened in um, in Brazil, in Santa Elena and, and in the Brazilian border, where there's another story. There's there's something related to the indigenous groups of my country, which we defend and love, but there's a mayor that has been elected and he's from the party of Guaido and they tried to get into a military unit and something happened there. 
and we, it's still not clear how these people, four people, died. We are, it's under investigations. We don't know where the fire came from. But when you see the TV, it seems that Maduro gave the order to his military to fire uh, on the people, and that is not true. We were very, very prudent, and we, we, re we resisted an invasion somehow, and it stopped. And now they are frustrated, and now they're going to Bogota to take decisions with the real boss of the group of the Lima, the Lima group, who is Mike Pence. And he's going to dictate the um, instructions and orders today um, in, this, in this group. Did the soldiers have live bullets? No, they didn't. That we would never use what you saw on the bridge on Tachira is what we saw every single day doing four months in Caracas, in Maracaibo, in Valencia in 2017. Even worse then, because it was every single day and people actually died and, and the people from the opposition had weapons, fire weapons as well. So it's for us, it was something um, smooth if we compare it to what we have suffered in the past with all this op uh, wild opposition we have in Venezuela. You mentioned uh, the uh, Mike Pence as being the real boss of the Lima Group. I wanted to ask you about this. To me, it's astonishing that uh, Guaido declared himself to be president the day after speaking on the phone <laughs> with the vice president of the United States. How, uh, the idea that a vice president would have a conversation with an opposition leader and immediately after the opposition leader declares himself president, then come out publicly with a video backing him. This was a plan. It was activated last year when they decided not to recognize the results of the presidential elections. And then they had to wait for the day of the inauguration of President Maduro, and uh, this plan was activated. And it it's, cannot be a coincidence that after this man goes to the, to the rally and in the middle of the street, in a square, public square, he raises his hand and he self-proclaims as president of Venezuela with no formality, no constitution provision to support what he was doing. Immediately, Mike Pence recognized him, and then Trump and the presidents of uh, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, and this, all these countries that are against the Venezuela. And, and following U.S. orders. So that was a plan, well plan, well, well organized from, from much before. And uh, we have to understand this. This is nothing is a coincidence when it comes to Venezuela and the U.S. Well, this is Venezuelan opposition leader, <clears throat> the self-proclaimed president, Juan Guaido, set to have his first meeting with Vice President Mike Pence, uh, speaking in Colombia. El día lunes. I will take part in this group, this meeting of the Lima Group, to meet with everyone, foreign ministers from the region, as well as with the United States Vice President Mike Pence to discuss possible diplomatic action of cooperation, or rather sovereign, as it should be for each country, in a show of respect for the Constitution so as to advance on this issue. So if you can respond to this, and Guaido is apparently meeting uh, Vice President Pence for the first time today, mm -hmm. and also will you let him <clears throat> back into Venezuela? He's in Colombia now. Uh, we don't, I don't know if he's coming back, if he's willing to come back to Venezuela, maybe, or what, what, what his plans are. But in any case, he's going to meet with his boss, you know, with, with Mr. Pence, and uh, he's going to ask Mr. Pence for a military intervention in Venezuela. He already said it, you know, this is... It's sad. It's sad, but it's also insane. You cannot st uh, um, believe or tell the people that you are the president, so-called president of your country, and ask for a foreign intervention against your people, against your family, against your friends. No, because bombs will not differentiate who's Chavista and who's not Chavista. So it's, it's I, I believe, we, I can almost not believe when I hear these people uh, calling for these things. I wanted to ask you about Guaido and uh, to recommend an article that Max Blumenthal wrote a few weeks ago in Gray, in gray Zone co uh, called The Making of Juan Guaido, How mm -hmm. the U.S. Regime Changed Laboratory Created Venezuela's Coup Leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and his, uh, uh, in his uh, article, he says that basically the, the many of the opposition, including Guaido, were groomed and trained yeah. uh, by uh, a, a group called the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action Strategies, which mm -hmm. is special specializes in regime changes around the world, uh, and also by the, the intelligence group Stratfor. I wonder if you could talk about Guaido's history. The most, uh, he was virtually unknown even in Venezuela until yes, a few yes. weeks ago. No, I believe that 99 percent of the Venezuelan people didn't know him January the 4th, no? 
when after January the 5th he was sworn as a president of the National Assembly, which is, was correct, and then he, he went on to, with this plan. But this generation of youngsters in Venezuela, they were trained by the intelligence groups of the United States and of other um, countries in order to make this regime change. What we saw in Ukraine, what we saw in some countries in the north of Africa, it's the same people training with all these color revolutions and whatever. So Leopoldo Lopez, Juan Guaido, this, it's a generation that was prepared for this. They know how to uh, make violence uh, protests. They know the speech, even the words they use. So this is nothing is coincidental. This is all part of a plan. We continue to look at the crisis in Venezuela, where the U.S. pressure to topple President Maduro's government has been building for years. Former FBI director Andrew McCabe reveals Trump privately discussed going to war with Venezuela as far back as 2017. In his new book, McCabe writes, quote, then the president talked about Venezuela. That's the country we should be going to war with, he said. They have all that oil and they're right on our back door. Uh, in September, The New York Times reported the Trump administration conducted secret meetings with rebellious military officers in Venezuela to discuss overthrowing Maduro. In November, John Bolton accused Venezuela, uh, Cuba and Nicaragua of being part of a troika of tyranny. The U.S. intensified its efforts once Juan Guaido became head of the National Assembly and led an effort to declare Maduro a usurper in an effort to remove him from office. On the day of Maduro's inauguration, January 10th, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called Guaido to congratulate him on his election victory to head the National Assembly. Then National Security Advisor John Bolton announced, quote, the United States does not recognize Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro's illegitimate claim to power, unquote. Vice President Mike Pence then spoke to Guaido on the night before he declared himself to be president of Venezuela on January 23rd to offer U.S. support. Then, on January 24th, Bolton openly admitted the U.S. actions are motivated by Venezuela's massive oil reserves. He told Fox Business it would be good for the United States if American companies produce the oil in Venezuela. Still with us, Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Ariaza. Um, I wanted to go to the latest threats over the weekend, uh, both um, a clip and a tweet. I wanted to turn to the role of Marco Rubio. Um, uh, but first, let's go to CNN's Jake Tapper questioning Secretary of State Mike Pompeo Sunday. How much does Venezuela's oil reserves, oil uh, capabilities, factor into what the United States is doing in Venezuela? We're aimed at a singular mission, ensuring that the Venezuelan people get the democracy that they so richly deserve. I am confident that uh, the Venezuelan people will ensure that Maduro's days are numbered. Secretary of State Pompeo also said the United States would pursue further sanctions on Venezuela. Meanwhile, Florida's Republican Senator Marco Rubio tweeted the violence on the border, quote, opened the door to various potential multilateral actions not on the table just 24 hours ago. And what many saw as a threat to Maduro, Rubio tweeted an image of a bloodied Muammar Gaddafi as he was being killed following the U.S. bombing campaign of Libya. Rubio also tweeted photos of former Panamanian leader Manuel Noriega, who was removed from power during the U.S. invasion in 1989. Foreign Minister Adiaza, can you talk about these latest threats? I, I don't think that this man, Marco Rubio, can represent the American people, no? the values by which the American people is known. Um, because how can you threat um, a, a, a president, a threat against his life so openly? And uh, what kind of, of, of representative is him from the people? Not even from the people from Florida, no? Of course, there's a lot of domestic poli politics here, because Trump needs to win Florida. I believe that Trump's days are numbered, because we, I truly believe that the American people will not re-elect Trump. So th that's the president that has the days numbered, really. But this, I, I believe Marco Rubio and Bolton are paid 
by each tweet about Venezuela. It's an obsession. On Saturday, it was, I don't know, if 40 tweets or more from Bolton and for, sorry, from Marco Rubio about the situation in Venezuela and telling um, lies. It was fake news all over his, his information. So how can the uh, electors, the voters that elected Marco Rubio stand this from happening? He has to be stopped as the war has to be stopped on Venezuela. I want to ask you about the situation inside Venezuela. And obviously, the opposition has grown. There are some accounts that even though President Maduro won uh, the most recent election, that he's deeply unpopular because of the economic crisis in the country, hyperinflation. Could you talk about the, the, the economic crisis? Has there been mismanagement? Uh, and has there been a move uh, to greater authoritarianism under President Maduro than there was under President Chavez? You know, my country at the moment is calm, everything's still smooth. People are going to their jobs, students are going to the university or to their schools, um, people are going to the beach on the weekends. We are almost, next weekend it's carnival in Venezuela and it's going to be a holiday. And, and ev all the pressure comes from abroad, from outside the country. You know? And, uh, but there is a large number of people leaving Venezuela, hasn't there? That, that's, those figures are not clear, but of course there is migration. We are blocked, Juan. Um, in order for us to pay for uh, what we need to produce uh, food or for the medicine we need, we have to... Uh, it, a transaction that should take 48 hours takes 48 days, if it ever happens. No? And of course there are some shortages, but we are better off today than we were a year ago and much more if we compare it to 2016 or 2017. We have done an effort not to sacrifice one Bolivar, one dollar for the uh, social policies in which we invest a lot of our budget. And we have done an effort to try to manage the economy in spite of the blockade. If you were to sit Mr. Stiglitz or the director of the IMF in the uh, seat of, in the chair of the Minister of Finance, and he would say, you have to do this, this and this. And if you take those decisions, nothing's going to happen, or something very different is going to happen that, he, that this person expected, because our economy is perturbated all over from abroad. So we're, and, and I must say that at this moment, this moment in time, um, we are better off. There's more food, there's more medicine, and uh, even some prices are lowering for the first time in two or three years. Even with the crippling U.S. sanctions, yes. with the amount of money that is being held in British banks and the U.S. saying they're giving the money from, uh, like, the Venezuelan company Citgo yeah. to Guaido, with um, the IMF reporting that inflation is over a million percent, many are suffering enormously. Millions have left. Mm, According to the U.N. Yes, more than one million, maybe, but not millions have left. And it's not one million, the inflation, those figures are uh, uh, crazy. But uh, we have an economic crisis. Has there been mismanagement? Maybe. We're not a perfect uh, government, and this, it, it's very difficult to know what decisions to take when your economy is, is under aggression, when there is an economic warfare against your economy. But I can say that the, the main reason why our economy has, has trouble is because of the uh, international attack, and spe specifically this blockade and sanctions from the U.S. If we didn't have those sanctions and that blockade, we could manage our economy. If we had the 30 billion Billion dollars that has cost that this blockade has costed over one year and a half, and 15 billion that our company Citgo uh, represents in the, as a value of the assets, things would be very different. So we have to understand this. This blockade is 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 being translated into the suffering of many Venezuelans, and this has to be stopped. I want to ask you about the international community because the, in all the commercial press here in the United States, the sense is that. Uh, the overwhelming number of countries have now declared uh, Venezuelan President Maduro illegitimate, but that's not the reality. The reality is that there are six, about 60 countries that are now recognizing Guaido, but there are uh, an equal number of countries and some of the biggest countries in the world that still mm -hmm. recognize uh, uh, President Maduro, and that the United States, neither the United States government nor Guaido has sought to go to the General Assembly to take a vote 
mm-hmm. because they would lose the vote in lose. the General Assembly. Can you talk about that, the, the dynamics of the uh, lineup in the international community on this yes, issue? Yes, the, the battlefield is in the international uh, sphere at the moment. And I must say that it's 52 governments that have said to recognize Mr. Guaido as the so-called president of Venezuela. This is part of the plan. What governments are this? The U.S., Canada, the, the governments from the Grupo de Lima, you know, the right-winged governments subordinated to Washington, the European Union, and two or three more countries in the world. So, but, I mean, I had a meeting last uh, Friday with over 60 delegations from all over the world, from the five continents here in the U.N. We had a meeting, and uh, we were very um, satisfied when we listened to countries from Latin America, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from Asia, from even some from Europe, giving support to the Venezuelan uh, constitutional government. But apart from that, because the aim is not to defend Maduro here, the aim is to defend the right to any nation to protect their sovereignty and not to interfere in their internal affairs. It's to protect this, the Charter of the United Nations, the principles and the purposes that they are in this charter. And we are creating a group, not we, it wasn't our initiative. Some countries with our participation are creating a group, which I believe will have more than 80 members um, to protect the Charter of the United Nations. And we are taking actions with the Secretary General, in the General Assembly, uh, even in the Security Council with this group. What is happening at the United Nations? You've met with Guterres now, the UN Secretary General, three times. We just played a clip of, Mich- a clip of Michelle Bachelet, mm-hmm. former president of Chile. Um, what do you want to happen right now? And do you want involvement of the Pope? Do you want involvement of Mexico with uh, the new president, Andres Manuel López Obrador? In the United Nations, what's happening is that there's a, a member of the United Nations, Venezuela, that's been under attack. And uh, the countries that are attacking Venezuela are violating every single principle of the Charter of the United Nations. So we expect for the Secretary General, for the General Assembly, to raise their voice and condemn this intervention in Venezuela and stop and not to um, be silent when the Charter is being violated. Um, what we are trying to do uh, in, in, also in the United Nations is to let them know the truth, what's happening. That's why I have I have met three times with with Guterres. But as well, we want the organizations of the United Nations, the agencies, to help us, because it's their uh, duty as well. Because what's the real problem? Banks don't want to work with Venezuela. So any transaction that happens through New York or through London, which are most of the transactions in the Western world, are stopped, are blocked. So we are working with some agencies of the United Nations in order for them to buy on what we need in Venezuela, medicines, food, and we will pay this once it's in the Venezuelan territory, in somewhere in the world, in in a financial financial route that we are designing. Because we have to look for these ways. We have done it. We're working with China, with Russia. We are working with uh, Turkey uh, very closely, but it's not been enough. So we need also the support of the United Nations uh, um, uh, organizations. But of course we want, we are sitting around the table. We are sitting, we're waiting for the opposition to sit again, because they usually sit and they stand up and they leave. We're sitting and waiting for Mr. Whomever, Guaido, whomever, to sit down and let's have dialogue. Do we need Mexico's Uruguay's uh, support or the, uh, the countries of the Caribbean? It's welcomed. We, I, I believe we don't even need it, because we're Venezuelans and we can solve this amongst Venezuelans. But if they are helping, they are welcomed. And what, whichever other country that wants to help for a sovereign solution, Solution amongst the Venezuelans, they are welcome in my country. And while this uh, is playing out, though, you, as you said, you you uh, you're willing to pay for the supplies you need, but you've got to have the revenue, the or the sale of oil. Uh, with the U.S. market cut off, have mm-hmm. other countries stepped forward? Uh, to, I know China has has long been buying Venezuelan oil. Uh, India has as well. Have these countries been stepping forward to say, we will fill the vacuum yes. and buy more of your oil? Yes, already. We already have new contracts with some other countries. And I'm, I'm not going to name them, because then Mr. Bolton threatens them. No? Immediately, when he knew that we had some negotiations with one of the Asian countries, he threatened that country. And he said that they wouldn't be forgotten 
Martin. So uh, I, I have to uh, be uh, uh, careful here, but we are already uh, uh, selling our oil, the oil that m was meant to come to the U.S. It's being sold to other countries in the world. <clears throat> Former President uh, Hugo Chavez survived a coup attempt mm -hmm. in 2002. Um, you're not only the foreign minister, you're also Chavez's son-in-law. Do you think Maduro will be able to survive this coup attempt? He has already survived the coup, because the coup was meant to happen between the February the 23rd and the first days of—I uh, mean, January the 23rd and the first days of February. It didn't happen. The military stood uh, loyal with the Constitution. And uh, what's happening now is that because the coup failed, now they're looking for what they call other options. And there is when it's dangerous. And I believe that the American people have a word here. They can, they, you can stop the war if you really tell your Congress and your government and your people and, and, and all over the streets, you raise your voice, because that's going to be a war on Venezuela against the Venezuelan people. Venezuelan people are going to die. There's going to be a bloodshed. But also, um, um, American soldiers would die, Marines would die in Venezuela, because we know how to resist. We are ready also to defend our homeland, but that's not what we want. I believe that the American people and the American uh, institutions can stop this from happening, this insane proposal of invading Venezuela, and this is the right time to do it. Well, on Friday, Democracy Now! spoke to Edgardo Lander, a Venezuelan sociologist and Maduro critic, who is also against U.S. regime change. He's a member of the Citizens Platform in defense of the Constitution and has backed a national referendum on the future of Venezuela. The Citizens Platform on Defense of the Constitution, as well as other groups, mainly from the left, but not only, have been arguing that we need this consultative referendum in order to have the Venezuelan people decide if they want to have new authorities overall in the country. That is, all the national powers, including the executive and the National Assembly. But that requires an agreement, because we need a new National Electoral Council. The current Electoral Council is completely controlled by the government, and it's not trustworthy for the majority of the Venezuelan population. That was Edgardo Lander, Venezuelan sociologist. Uh, uh, your, uh, your, your comments, uh, Foreign Minister, about the possibility of a referendum as a way out of the crisis uh, that's existing now? First of all, I have a lot of respect for Edgardo Lander. And uh, he used to be to accompany us for many years. Now he's changed position, but he's a coherent man. And uh, what, what I do believe is that this constitution has many solutions that can be studied, but it has to happen in the dialogue process. Now, you cannot impose a solution. You cannot say it's the referendum or, as the U.S. and the European Union say, it, you have to do repeat the presidential elections. We have to sit down with the opposition, and we have to reach um, political agreements and uh, analyze each option, but not the war, but uh, political options, and uh, find our way as Venezuelans, because we're brothers and sisters with the opposition as well. So that's what we have to do, and we're waiting for the opposition. And even the Pope has called the opposition. And we wish that Secretary General Guterres would call the opposition to sit down, because that is the answer to everything. We've been through tougher times in the past in Venezuela, and the uh, opposition sits down and then stands up. But at the moment, they have the order from the Pentagon or the White House telling them, do not sit around the table with the people of Maduro, because you are not allowed by us. So we hope that there is some uh, rectification from the opposition, but of course, in the U.S. government, in order to give them permission to sit down with the Venezuelan government. So you have this very unusual situation right now. President Trump is flying off to Vietnam yes. uh, to meet with the North Korean leader. Um, you have the vice president, Pence, um, who issued this statement in support of Guaido, spoke to him before he announced that he himself was president, not Pence, but Guaido of Venezuela. Um, and so you have Pence and Guaido in Colombia meeting with the Lima Group to get these countries to invade Venezuela. What countries would fend off 
an invasion, would fight alongside Venezuela? We have not even thought about it. We were not considering war, no? We are, we are prepared to defend our sovereignty, but we're not thinking about coalitions or these things. Um, but this that is happening uh, between Trump and, and the chairman of, of North Korea, it could happen with President Maduro as well. Why don't they meet? And why, why don't— this would solve everything, because Maduro is the boss of the government in Venezuela, and Trump is the boss of the opposition in Venezuela. So that would be the correct way. But even uh, apart from that, we must sit with the opposition as well. So um, this thing in Colombia, I believe that not even most of these countries of the Grupo de Lima, they would not support a military intervention, although they are helping to create the conditions, you know, with all this trying to isolate Venezuela and the Venezuelan government and people. They, they have helped, but I don't think that they would support a military intervention. There, is a fir there, there are two countries that should be denounced all over the world, the U.S. and Colombia. Colombia is um, uh, letting the U.S. use their territory to attack Venezuela. I wanted to ask you, in terms of what you said, a, a, a comment you made a few minutes ago, that the president has already survived, President Maduro has already survived the coup attempt. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some articles I've seen in the financial press where the business community and the financial community is precisely worried about a drawn-out affair. They, the, because uh, there's a there's a, there's a reality that there's a, a a huge debt that Venezuela has to the to uh, the world financiers in terms of its uh, bond debt. Uh, there's the issue of what the disruption, further disruption of Venezuelan oil supply could mean to the uh, the, the world financial community. So that the the business community even of the United States, does not want a drawn-out uh, ongoing battle uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, between the U.S. government and Venezuela. I'm wondering, the discussions that your government has had with some of the oil companies that are invested in Venezuela mm -hmm. and some of the bankers who have been lending money to Venezuela about the current crisis, if you're able to talk about that. Yes, we, we the, even... American companies in working in Venezuela, European companies, Asian companies, and they, they are working at the moment. They are producing oil and exporting oil, and they are worried because they want to keep on um, doing it, doing this, this, this um, um, uh, oil production. So even the financial markets are worried because they don't want a war. They want everything to be calmed, and in a end, we can, we can pay for all our debts if we are not under sanctions if, if we're not blocked, if we, there are no aggressions against Venezuela. So that would be the best for the international markets. That's, that's the reality. We, can pay, we have paid thousands and thousands and thousands of millions of dollars, no, billions of dollars with, uh, with, with our debt and in the past, and we would be able to do so if they stop attacking Venezuela. So I wanted to go to Fox Business, where John Bolton recently spoke, the national security advisor, openly saying U.S. oil companies could benefit from what's happening in Venezuela. We're in conversation with major American companies now that are either in Venezuela or, in the case of Citgo, here in the United States. Uh, I think we're trying to get to the same end result here. You know, uh, Venezuela is one of the three countries I call the troika of tyranny. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of the United States. That's National Security Advisor John Bolton on Fox Business. Foreign Minister Adias. Bolton is like a gangster. When it's about Venezuela, he, he, he really is harsh and there's no sense in what he says, but he has said something that is truth. All of this is about oil. No, they want Maduro out because they want to regain the control they had over the Venezuelan economy and especially over PDVSA, our company, before the Bolivarian Revolution. They want the Venezuelan oil because it is the largest reserve of oil in all the world and it's very close to the U.S. territory. And that is not going to happen because we will defend 
our territory, our people will be defended, and uh, we have to sit down and give some. If they want to invest in Venezuela, Chevron is in Venezuela. So if other companies want to invest in Venezuela, they have to talk to us, they have to respect the Venezuelan law, and that's everything. But uh, you cannot be toppling um, governments, ousting presidents in order to have control over the natural resources, although that's what Trump said recently, no, about that if he were to intervene in other countries, he needed uh, the loot in order to to be paid for what they what they are doing. This cannot happen in Venezuela. That's why I, I'm telling you this can be stopped here in the U.S. if you do the right things. I wanted to ask you about the, the Lima Group. Um, it's inconceivable, it would have been inconceivable 10 years ago. Uh, that so many Latin American uh, countries mm -hmm. would have lined up uh, with the United States condemning Venezuela because there was a pink tie throughout Latin America mm -hmm. of uh, progressive and socially oriented governments. But now, of course, we've had a a, a, a conservative tide now mm -hmm. uh, with Bolsonaro in Brazil and Duque in in uh, in, uh, in Colombia. Can you talk about the impact of the changes in Latin America on Venezuela's ability to withstand? this kind of aggression? These changes were not for free. You know? The United States, the CIA, uh, suddenly I believe that everything was concentrated in, in the Middle East. And when Barack Obama turned his face and he saw what he con they considered their backyard, he said, hey, look what's happening. This Chavez fellow and Lula and these people in Argentina and Nicaragua, we have to do something about this. And they began to send resources, to support candidates, to do campaigns against the, the, right, the left wing, the candidates, and they regained governments, which respond exclusively to the orders of the United States. And that's why the Lima Group exists. Uh, but this is going to change again, because the peoples of Latin America are watching, and they are analyzing the situation, and they feel that these governments do not represent them. Governments that want a war, governments that impose neoliberalism in their countries again. So this is going to change. We have to have some strategic patience in order to see how cha things will change again in Latin America. And what is the role right now of L.A.D. Abrams? He's clearly Trump's point person, uh, publicly chosen as yes. the envoy to Venezuela, uh, flew down in a military transport last week to Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if if you, I want to go to a clip of, um, of Elliot Abrams recently speaking. Maduro has proven he will manipulate any call for negotiations to his advantage. And he has often used so-called dialogues as a way to play for time. We urge all involved to deal solely with the legitimate Guaido government. The time for dialogue with Maduro has long passed. So that's Elliot Abrams. The time for dialogue has long passed. Again, Vice President Pence in Colombia right now. I think a lot of people will be surprised to hear you being so calm at this point, as this weekend they announced that a U.S. military action is now a possibility, a very serious uh, intervention. There are too many contradictions. I've met two times with Elliot Abrams during the last month, and we have had uh, meetings that have lasted more than two hours, with lots of differences, but we, we have maintained respect between us, and uh, we have said our truths, and they are negotiating with us. No? We have just uh, extended the, the presence of, uh, of uh, diplomats from the U.S. in Caracas for 15 more days. And this was, this was agreed with, with the American delegation. Uh, it's, it's Elliot Abrams and it's uh, Kimberly Byer, the undersecretary. And we have to keep on. So they say that, we, that the opposition cannot have dialogue with the government, but they are having dialogue with us. So it's, it's, it's real politics here, what, what's happening. And we hope that this channel with Mr. Abrams or whomever is appointed by President Trump is um, uh, always open and that we can have contacts because that's the ci civilized things to do you know, amongst countries that respect the sovereignty and the international law.
Okay. Well, that does it for the show mm -hmm. uh, for today. Jorge Ariaza, Venezuela's foreign minister. Um, Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermin Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masu, Trina Ndura, Tamari Astudio, and Libby Rainey, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Naguera, engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby. Uh, to see our previous interview with the foreign minister and all of our coverage of Venezuela, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.